Why Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you? the kindness you've shown. Lord, help me, Jesus. I've wasted it so. Help me, Jesus. I know what I Tell me, Lord, if you think there's a way I can try to repay all I've taken from you. And maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through. All of you who feel dry and thirsty, come, come to the water. Fill your hands, splash your face, drink deeply, let it run down your chin. Living water, we give thanks for springs of water and deep wells, for the streams and the rivers of the watershed, for the rains that fall. We give thanks for water that sustains our life. We give thanks for water that washes and cleans for water that refreshes and restores. We give thanks for water that renews our life. We give thanks for your love and mercy pouring into our lives soaking into our parched places, filling us to the brim, overflowing in us to be a blessing for all. Come to the water of life.
A warm welcome to all as we gather together in worship. Thank you for joining our recorded service at St. Jacob's Mennonite Church. We invite you to fully enter into this time of worship, bringing whatever you carry with you. As we continue our summer theme, I invite you once again to come, come to the water. It is an invitation that's hard to resist, especially in the heat of summer. And this morning I have chosen to come to the waters of the Conestogo River. What is it that draws us to various bodies of water? I'm not sure I can even begin to identify all that it holds for me, but simply put, it has the power to refresh, renew, and restore. For me, it's also the awareness of the beauty of this aspect of creation that God has provided for us to enjoy. This week, our water theme on healing will focus on the Old story, Old Testament story of Naaman, who was in need of healing. Healing was also central to the ministry of Jesus, who restores wholeness of body, mind, and spirit. And these last 16 months have challenged our well-being in all of these areas. As we come to the water today, what is it that each of us are looking or hoping for? What needs healing in our lives? When we pray for healing, what is our expectation of how God will answer? Can we open ourselves to healing that may occur in unanticipated ways? Naaman almost lost his chance for healing because of his expectations for how it should happen. Let us open our heart, mind, and spirit to God's transforming work and healing in our lives. I invite you to join me in prayer. God of all creation, whether we are in our homes, backyards, cottages, or campgrounds, we have come once again to the water. Though we are not meeting in person, your spirit draws us together in worship. Thank you for this Conestogo River and for all the other rivers, lakes, and waters that are life-giving and a gift from you. Help us not to take them for granted and to care for them. God, our healer, in many ways we are all in need of your healing spirit flowing through our lives. Help us to have childlike faith in you, believing you know us intimately and will heal us in whatever way that is needed. In this hour of worship, help us wade into this river, refreshing and abundant. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is living water. Amen. Yonder come day, day is a breaking. Yonder come day, oh my soul. Yonder come day, day is a breaking. Sun is a rising in my soul. Yonder come day, day is a breaking. Yonder come day, oh my soul. Yonder come day, day is a breaking, sun is a rising in my soul. Yonder come day, day is a breaking, yonder 
Our family became acquainted with Mazinaw Lake in the mid-1960s when we were looking for a campsite. I was employed by Burns Meats and our Burns Eastern Ontario salesman informed me about a newly opened Bon Echo Provincial Park on Mazinaw Lake. We camped there and were so impressed by it that we returned many times, and some of our friends also chose Bon Echo for camping. Mathenaw Lake is truly a wonder of God's creation. A lake bordered by a ridge of solid rock, which has over 260 paintings done by many years ago by the Algonquin indigenous tribe. This rock, reminds us of, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. There are steps leading to the top of the rock, and there you have a panoramic view of Mazanaw Lake, a lake that is very deep. Average depths, 135 feet, maximum 476 feet. That is a lot of water. It is a photographer's paradise. We have experienced calm, beauty, peace, and rest at this lake. Mark 6, 31, Jesus says to his disciples, come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. Mathana Lake is a place to rest and experience the refreshing of our souls and bodies. We as a family have enjoyed many of the activities at the campgrounds. We enjoyed watching movies or a special program with other campers. Our young family really enjoyed going to the amphitheater for stories, pictures, music, and a sharing of activities. Our children always looked forward to these happy times. We enjoyed our campfires, eating hot dogs and marshmallows, listening to the evening sounds of the lake. During the day, we could enjoy many activities that the water of Lake Mathenau provided, swimming, fishing, water sports. You have probably heard of the Loch Ness Monster. There have been talks of a huge snake-like creature 20 feet long that lurks in the deep waters of Mathenau. One picture on the, on the rock shows a dinosaur-like creature with a long spiked tail. We decided maybe it's best to swim in shallow water where you can see the bottom. Watching the beautiful sunsets over Mathenau Lake gives us a real appreciation of our Creator, and we give thanks to God for providing places of solitude and rest beside the still water. Let me tell you a story about a young girl and Nauman. Naaman was general of the army under the king of Aram. He was important to his master, who held him in the highest esteem because it was by him that God had given victory to Aram. 
a truly great man, but afflicted with a terrible skin disease. It so happened that Aram, on one of its raiding expeditions against Israel, captured a young girl who became a maid to Naaman's wife. One day, she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of his skin disease. Naaman went straight to his master and reported what the girl from Israel had said. Well, then go, and I'll send a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. So he went off, taking with him about 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. Naaman delivered the letter to the king of Israel. The letter read, when you get this letter, you'll know that I've personally sent my servant Naaman to you. Heal him and of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he was terribly upset, ripping his robes to pieces. He said, Am I a god with the power to bring life and death, that I get orders to heal this man from his disease? What's going on here? That king's trying to pick a fight. That's what. Elisha, the man of God, heard what happened, that the king of Israel was so distressed that he had ripped his robe to shreds. He sent word to the king, Why are you so upset ripping your robe like this? Send him to me so he'll learn that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman with his horses and chariots arrived in style and stopped at Elisha's door. Elijah sent out a servant to meet him with this message. Go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be as good as new. Naaman lost his temper. He spun around saying, I thought he'd personally come out and meet me. Call on the name of God, wave his hand over the disease spot and get rid of the disease. The Damascus rivers Anaba and Farpar are the cleaner by far than any of the rivers in Israel. Why not bathe in them? I at least get clean. He stomped off, mad as a hornet, but his servants caught up with him and said, Father, if the prophet asks you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not this symbol, washing me clean? So Naaman did it. He went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, following the orders of the holy man. His skin was healed. It was like the skin of a little baby. He was as good as new. The story of Naaman's healing is powerful. What do you make of Elijah's attitude toward Naaman? Did Naaman's arrival with horses and chariots turn him off? Was he too busy to see Naaman that he sent out a servant? To me, it appeared that Naaman was a bit disgusted by having to bathe in dirty water and resisted Elisha's message initially. Naaman's perception of how healing ought to take place was completely different from God's plan. How often we, myself included, resist things that God may like us to do. In the end, all that Naaman needed to do was go wash in the River Jordan seven times. God's message was and is often very simple. The best part of the story is that Naaman is healed. His healing had nothing to do with the river. God was the healer and Naaman knew it. Naaman says, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Everyone needs the help of God to excel in life. And when Naaman was healed, he gave glory to God for what he's done. I pray that your life will become a good example for people to learn from. May you stand out and be outstanding in Jesus name. If Naaman had not obeyed the instructions of Elisha, there would be no story. Oh, healing river, 
Send down your waters, send down your waters upon this land, O healing river. Send down your waters and wash the blood from off of the sand. This land is marching. This land is burning, no seed is growing in the barren ground. O healing river, send down your waters. O healing river, send your waters down. Let the sea of freedom awake and flourish, let the deep roots nourish, let the tall stalks rise, O healing river, send down your water, O healing river, from out of the sky. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. Oh, don't you want to go to that gospel feast, that promised land where all is peace? O oh, deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. For people of faith, the Jordan River is layered with meaning and history and deep significance. We hear it in this famous African-American spiritual sung by an oppressed people longing for the freedom on the other side or in another spiritual from former slaves who often had to literally cross rivers in the middle of the night on a journey to freedom. Michael, row your boat ashore. Jordan's river is deep and wide. Hallelujah, meet my mother on the other side. Jordan's river is chilly and cold, chills the body, but not the soul. Hallelujah. The biblical reference, of course, is to the crossing of the Jordan River at Jericho by the people of Israel after their long suffering 40 years in the wilderness. They were finally entering the promised land in an unexpected way, crossing the Jordan that even Moses could only look down on from the mountain and never cross himself. The Jordan Valley then becomes this symbol of fertility and abundance, the river, a source of life for the people. In the New Testament, we first see John the Baptist in this same Jordan Valley announcing repentance and baptism in the river. Jesus requests baptism from John in this same Jordan River, and hears the voice of God, You are my beloved with whom I am well pleased. And much of his ministry is along the Jordan River from the Sea of Galilee. No wonder this river, the Jordan, is lifted up in our imaginations and becomes a metaphor and symbol of strength and renewal and liberation, and healing, and faith. I wonder, how have you imagined this river in your mind, the physical river itself? I brought all these levels of biblical stories and meaning and the expectations of a huge, mighty river to my 1992 learning trip to Israel-Palestine. On one of the days, we had a scheduled stop at one of the three supposed spots claimed to be where the baptism of Jesus may have taken place. Now a kind of off-putting tourism baptism spot. It was underwhelming. 
Here was this small little stream, a kind of polluted muddy creek that you could just easily wade across. I was asked to read the story of Jesus' baptism as we stood beside this river. It put a different perspective on the story and the river. And for me, awakened more of a curiosity than any kind of disappointment. This river was more ordinary, everyday, simple, and yet still had such profound meaning and sustenance for people of faith over the centuries. Part of this, of course, is a modern contemporary problem. The river, like so much in this geography, has been caught up in complicated politics. Over the centuries, this roughly 251 kilometer river has flowed from the high point on the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias Sea, to the low point, the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth at 414 meters below sea level. A great place with its salt levels to try floating. Historically, the Jordan River was the largest source of clean water and fertility of the land. And there were mighty sections and places as well that flooded periodically. In 1953, the national water carrier built by Israel diverted much of the water to the coastal plains and away from the West Bank. And there have been dams and diversion canals and other forms of siphoning off water, including some by the countries of Jordan and Lebanon as well, plus an increase in pollution, raw sewage and agricultural runoff. There are big environmental concerns. The estimate of the flow of water is about 10% of what it used to be. It is also one of the most contested transboundary waters in the Middle East and a heavy militarized political border. Water and the Jordan River will continue to be a source of conflict and tension moving forward, even as various NGOs and local groups work at restoring the river. Nonetheless, even in the time of the scriptures, the significance and symbol of the Jordan was much grander than the river itself. Which brings us to today's scripture and the story of Naaman being healed of leprosy in the Jordan River. In many ways, the role of the river and even the healing in this story is also underwhelming. And it is the surprises within the various characters and the small voices and the twists and turns and expectations that give this story its meaning. It is told by a master storyteller that draws us in and makes us ask questions about our own lives. It invites conversation and is maybe best shared within a group of people reading the story together. I do look forward to our worship response time later. I love what the Clemmers did with the story, and I had rich conversations with Sue as we planned this service. It was also a story I used for one of our two hour or so morning devotional times around a campfire last week with the group of MCEC multicultural pastors that were part of the backcountry canoe trip I led with him to Kawartha Highlands. This is an intercultural story. So lots of insights and perspectives from all into this story. What is immediately striking are the different levels of power and status of the different characters, the social stratification, people of different classes and powers that interact with each other, and how in each case, it is the person of lower status that provides the answer, the encouragement, the correction, and the healing message of God. As the canoeing pastors pointed out, pay attention to the small ones. A quick review of the story and characters. We start with Naaman, a great man, powerful, a mighty warrior, yet the one with a skin disease of some sort, named here as leprosy, that threatens his status, making him untouchable. Note that he is also an outsider to Israel and to those hearing the scriptures. 
Then there is Naaman's unnamed wife, and below her the captured young Hebrew girl slave, who would have gone through who knows what kinds of trauma and pain. Yet she is the one who points for hope for her captor with the prophet from Samaria, itself the underbelly province of Israel. The high-level king gets involved with official letters and gifts, only to scare the vassal king of Israel, fearing it is another power ploy doomed to violence. But Elisha hears about it and offers help. The scene is quite humorous, Naaman with all his horses and chariots, but Elisha refusing to even meet with Naaman, sending messengers, underlings, with the instructions to wash seven times in the Jordan. Not even an appearance of the prophet, no hocus-pocus waving of arms. The mighty, the muddy Jordan of all rivers, not the bigger, better, and cleaner waters of Damascus. It is his servants this time who help Naaman drop his anger, reframe his expectations, and continue his path towards healing. One author calls this a downward descent. For healing, for help, we must go down, past our pride, past our hurts, past our blind spots, past our titles and possessions, to that place of honesty and helplessness where healing might just surprise us. Sue and I talked about how hard it can be to become vulnerable and to accept help from others. We so easily put up walls and hide our pain and our issues behind a polite front, a, a kind of mask covering up what is underneath. By doing so, we close ourselves off from potential healing. Again and again, it is the small ones, those without all the airs of power and status that move the story towards healing. And for Naaman, there is healing. And, and can it be this simple? This simple, silly act of washing seven times in the Jordan by himself, without any hoopla, underwhelming, like the river itself, yet a beautiful gift, all made possible by the small acts of kindness from unexpected places, the vulnerable downward descent, and the healing power of God. As I sat around the campfire circle last week, I wondered and, and almost expected this multicultural pastor group to really focus on the physical healing from this story. And yes, there was the healing of leprosy for Naaman, and we can point to physical healing that can happen in our lives. But they were more interested in the multiple levels of healing for Naaman and for us, wholeness of mind, body, and spirit, emotional, relational, societal, our relationship with God. Naaman is a different person by the end of the story, much more humble, and real and open to God and in a different relationship with the people around him. It is like he has become humanized, ordinary, everyday, simple. As Joseph, the Chin pastor said, this story is about the living water, the living water of God. He was connecting this story to Jesus in John 4 and other passages. Jesus as the water of life that makes a difference in how we live, that gives our spirits life. As Sue said, the power to refresh, renew, and restore, to transform our very lives. Healing did not happen in the manner that Naaman expected or on his terms. He almost missed it. Yet healing did happen on multiple levels. Some of us are carrying difficult health journeys within our families and loved ones, some of which do not lead to physical healing. Our finite human lives have their limits, their ends. Yet beautiful things happen within relationships, within the emotional and spiritual strength 
given by God to walk through tough journeys, within the support given by others, the accompaniment, the prayers, the acts of kindness. Healing comes in unexpected ways. It comes from the small voices. And God is present as living water, healing and transforming our lives. These are healing waters too. Around the campfire, we do dove into lots of issues out of the story, trying to understand the Canadian residential school history, racial discrimination, how to become an intercultural church, and more immediately, how to pray for the country of Myanmar, with its recent violent military takeover complicating its pandemic third wave, where over 60 Christian pastors have died of COVID recently. Joseph was showing me live stream videos of bodies at the morgue while we looked out on the pristine waters of Vixen Lake. Quite the contrast. How does one pray? What kind of healing is possible in our world? How do we listen to those voices? There are some biblical postscripts to this Naaman story. If you keep reading 2 Kings 5, we find that Naaman returns and stands before Elisha with a declaration of faith in God, in Yahweh, and with a posture of gratitude and thanksgiving and with the offer of gifts. Elisha will not accept these, these gifts, which is so hard for Naaman and hard for us when we are on the receiving end, especially if we are typically the ones giving. Remember, the waters have been given freely. Then Naaman decides to bring some physical dirt, some earth home with him as a reminder, with the promise to worship only Yahweh. With this exception or pardon asked on one count, when by demand he needs to bow along with the king to Rimon, to, with the king to Rimon, living with the power structures of the day will continue to be complicated in his role. To which Elisha simply and graciously says, go in peace. Postscript 2, a little later in that same passage, Elisha's servant Gehazi ch chases after Naaman, who got off so lightly from Elisha, selfishly trying to secure these offered tangible gifts of silver and clothing for himself. He is found out and is left with leprosy clinging to him. One more biblical postscript, maybe the most important one, the only other biblical reference to Naaman in the all-important Luke 4 sermon to, of Jesus to his hometown in Nazareth, announcing the mission given to him by the Spirit of the Lord to bring good news to the poor and release to the captives. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. There were many widows in, e in Israel in the time of Elijah, but Elijah was sent to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, but none of them cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Jesus, in this sermon, points to the outsiders, the foreigners, the non-religious, to those suffering to the small voices, to the unexpected, where the heart of his ministry will be, where we will witness his living waters, where healing will happen on multiple levels. We are invited to join that ministry. There is a river, a river underwhelming upon first appearance, a river that may not seem like much. A river that, if you follow it, will bring you into twists and turns you would never have anticipated and into unexpected relationships with people that will surprise and delight you. It is a river that promises living water, that restores relationships, that uplifts the small ones, that brings hope, that brings healing in unforeseen and astonishing ways. It is a river that is deep, 
that brings us deep into our relationship with our God. Don't you want to go to that gospel feast, that promised land where all is peace? O oh, deep river Lord, I want to cross over into campground. Amen. My name is Seth Chrisman. And I'm Greg Yoder, and we are two members of the Walking Roots Band. With, I remember her telling me one time, she prays through the Psalms like twice a year. Like she mm -hmm. prays them every day. Mm -hmm. Because she says like, I need those words in my heart and in my head whenever I need to praise and also whenever I need to cry out. And if I yeah. don't pray those words, like, so. We need to have these kind of songs to sing so that we have that as part of our musical and emotional vocabulary, um, whether whether we need those songs in the moment or um, we're preparing ourselves for a time to come when we will, because everybody has those times um, when they need them. And right. yeah, it's important that the church is singing these songs because we don't always know um, when when our brothers and sisters are needing these kind of songs and yeah. often when you do need those kind of songs uh, it's almost impossible to sing them for yourself this song which like is was born in like us like walking together and like this other like yeah li life like i hope that it serves as seed for other communities to like also create songs that like talk about their experience um, as they walk with God and yeah. through like the good stuff and through the dark valleys. Yeah. How long, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Am I forsaken? How long will you hide your face? Oh Lord, I am shaken. How long, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Am I forsaken? How long will you hide your face? Oh Lord, I am shaken. See how I pass my weary days in sighs and groans. And when it's night, 
My bed is watered with my tears, my grief consumes and dims my sight. How long, O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Am I forsaken? How long will you hide your face? O oh Lord, I am shaken. How long, O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Am I forsaken? How long will you hide your face? O oh Lord, I am shaken. Look how the powers of nature mourn. How long, how long, Almighty God, how long? When shall your hour of grace return? When shall I make your grace my song? How long, O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Am I forsaken? so near the grave oh my soul my soul is tempted to despair but graves can never praise the Lord for all is dust in silence Forsaken, how long will you hide your face? Oh Lord, I am shaken. As we gather for a time of congregational prayer, there are a couple of significant items to bring to your attention. First of all, an update from the Refugee Sponsorship Committee. Last Thursday, we received the news we have been waiting for. The Shahadeh family of six can immigrate to Canada within four to 10 weeks. This is exciting news. The most urgent need is for housing. In today's market, rental costs will be higher than first anticipated. There are also a number of other basic items that we still need for this family, and some of those details can be found in our newsletter. So we want to pray for the Shahade family and the Refugee Committee as we anticipate and plan for this significant transition. And we pray for creative solutions to the challenge of finding housing. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. And secondly, as Waterloo Region has moved into stage three of reopening, we look forward to starting our in-person worship services on August 8th. This is good and exciting news as well. We will continue to follow the Waterloo Region public health guidelines and we have good protocols in place to keep everyone safe. Face, masks, face mask requirements will remain in place. So come and join us at 10 a.m. on August 8th. For the first few weeks, we anticipate worship will be a hybrid model of some live worship elements along with the pre-recorded worship service. And recorded services will continue to be available through our website. 
and we'll keep you updated if there are any changes. So for this exciting uh, new development, we pray, thanks be to God. Please join me now in a time of congregational prayer. God of love, today we express our gratitude for all the ways that water renews, refreshes, and restores us and our land. We give thanks for all the signs of renewal and regeneration that we witness in our natural world. We offer thanks for all the ways we do experience healing from physical injuries and illnesses, reconciliation in strained, damaged, and broken relationships, forgiveness for past mistakes, hurts, and regrets, release from anxieties and attachments that hold us captive. We know that healing can happen in many different ways, but not always in the way that we want. As we pray for healing for ourselves and for others, help us to trust your wisdom and your promise that whatever unfolds, you will be present with us. We pray for healing of our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. We pray for continued healing for our Canadian community, for freedom from fear, prejudice, judgment, and assumptions. We pray for healing and renewal of our planet and our attitudes toward the natural world. We pray for loved ones in palliative care and those who are tending to their needs. And we pray for those who are grieving the death of a loved one. May your comforting love surround them. We pray for relief from pain, fear, anger, and despair. And we pray for comfort, peace, and courage. Surround these families with your love in this difficult, vulnerable, and sacred time. And as we gather up our brokenness and bring it to you now, we pray for healing in whatever way that may happen. Let your healing waters flow. Amen. And now, 
Go in the healing power of Christ. Humbly open to God's touch upon you. May God breathe a breath of hope into your broken places so that healing and hope might flow through you and into the world. Go in peace. Amen. i